Good morning to everyone. We're certainly thankful for the grace and the privilege to be here. We are thankful, again, as I said, for God's grace and mercy this morning. Pray for providence. Pray for God's people everywhere. Pray that God would send us laborers into the field. Again, it is a delight to see each and every one of you this morning. I invite you to turn with us to Again, to the Gospel of John, third chapter. Uh, again, reading at the 16th verse. Again, there's, there's nothing new here. And I don't come to bring you anything new. Because if I bring you something new, uh, then I'm getting it out of the scripture, way out of the scripture. And uh, that's not where we want it to come from. We want it to come from God's word. We want it to be the truth of God's word. We want that truth to be ripened by his Holy Spirit and honoring and glorifying unto him above everything else. <clears throat> Y'all pray for me this morning. Bear with me if I tend to clear my throat a lot, which I've noticed from, from everybody else's expressions that y'all are enjoying the, the pollen as much as I am, so uh, we'll, uh, we'll get through this together. John 3, 16, familiar scripture. Probably most of you in here could close your eyes and recite this one word for word. If you ever memorized scripture, this is probably one of the first ones that you ever memorized. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. <clears throat> for God so loved the world. Now for that to really make any sense to us, we've got to back up to the 14th verse where we find, and remember, this is Jesus teaching this now. This wasn't, this wasn't just John's writing. This, this, is, this is the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he tells him, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world. God loved the world in the same fashion with which he foreshadowed in Moses' day, whenever there were fiery serpents going among the camp of Israel, and everyone that was bitten of that serpent died. Now, I want you to understand something here. They were still Israel. They were still of the camp of Israel that, that were bit by that serpent and died. But God sent a remedy to them for that death. And that remedy was a, was a brazen serpent that they raised up on a, on a pole. And everyone that was bitten of, of, the, of the poisonous serpent 
if they were if they were able to look upon that brazen serpent, that bite didn't kill them. So we see that the thing that God had Israel looking upon in that day and time to allow them to not perish by the bite of the serpent was something that was in the likeness of the serpent but was not the serpent. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. I hope you understand this morning, child of God, that even though Jesus had a form of flesh like as, as, as under what we are, and that he was in that, in that essence barely man, that he was still barely God, and that he was raised up before us, being a representative for us, and yet not exactly like us. One of the biggest differences being that whereas our blood came from our forefather Adam, his blood came from his father God. And there, if you do a little medical study, that, that makes a great difference. It, it, it uh, surprised a lot of people. Surprised me the first time that I ever came across that and discovered the truth of it. That even though we are carried in our mother's wombs, our blood does not come from our mother. Our blood doesn't even mingle with our mother's blood. The, 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 that that's in our DNA that, that causes our blood to form always comes from the father. And, and it's poison to the child in the womb if something goes wrong and the blood of the mother actually is, actually is able to, to, to mix with the, with, with the child's blood. That child will come sick. You say, well, what's that got to do with anything? It's got everything to do with it. Because you see, our father Adam, his blood was tainted with sin. And he passed that taint on, on to us. But, but that second Adam, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, his, his blood was from God. It was pure and it was holy and it was untainted and it did not mix with Mary's blood or else it would not have continued to be holy and untainted. So he was like us, but not. Just as that brazen serpent was like the serpents that were, that were uh, infecting and, 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 and causing Israel so much harm before, but were not. God so loved the world. God loved the world in, 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 a, broad, in a broader sense just as he loved his people Israel as a microcosm of, of his will and his purpose for his people here in the world and that as he sent the serpent up there to, to relieve them, so he sent his only begotten son. We tend to, we're, we're so familiar with this that, that we tend to just, we, we read it quick, don't we? When was the last time that you actually read this, thought about it, and stopped and gave it a little time to sink in? For God so loved. For God so loved. If you, by faith, have been blessed to look upon the cross of Calvary, I hope that you understand this morning and that it finds a lodging place in your soul that that is because God so loved. And I know that Jesus here spoke in the broad sense that God so loved the world. But I want to tell you something, child. If you are blessed to see and understand that the man Jesus hung there between heaven and earth and died on that cross for you, not only did God so love the world, but God so loved you. You can put your name in that spot if you understand that Jesus Christ was offered upon the cross of Calvary to, to wash your sins away from you and to cleanse you whiter than snow. Amen. And yes, God so loved the world as he was speaking of here. But God so loved Robbie and God so loved Amber 
And God so loved Randy, you can put your name in that spot and rejoice in the understanding that God so loved. That like as he raised up the serpent in the wilderness, he gave his only begotten son. Now we understand that by the adoption of grace, we are the sons of God. We are the children of God. And we rejoice in that. But he only had one begotten son. And that was Jesus Christ. And God gave his only begotten son for the salvation of his adopted children. And you let that sink in real good. I don't know how many of you might have ever adopted. Uh, we had a foster son for a while. Uh, no people that have adopted. And there, there's one thing about the rules of adoption that, that are very striking. And one of them is, you know, your natural born child, you can cut them out of your will. But a child that you adopt, no matter what they do or how they behave or where they go or what they say, you cannot disinherit an adopted child. You cannot disinherit an adopted child. And if Jesus, if you think about the words of Jesus and when he told us, you know, all that the Father giveth me will come unto me, and he that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. And when was the last time you let that one sink in for a little bit? If the Father has drawn you to the Son, Jesus said that in that drawing of the Father to himself, that he would in no wise, and you understand the phrase in no wise, that there was no reason that existed that he would ever, ever cast you out. What a wonder. What a wonder. And again, I know there are a lot of people in the world of the heart. Well, if I believe that, I'd just do whatever I wanted to do. Well, you know, there, there, there's a lot that can be said about that. First of all, the, the, the Bible says God forbid. But that's not according to God's will and purpose. And if God shows you that truth, it is not in order for you to just go out and, 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 and wall in the mire of this world and have a big old time. But I'm going to tell you something, child. That when, if God truly shows you that truth and makes it live in your heart, not only is it not for you to go out and wallow in the world, but it's a, you're going to not want to go out and wallow in the world. It changes you. There is a transformation that takes place whenever we are truly brought to the understanding that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that he did not hold not even the crown of glory from us that we might dwell in his presence. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And this is where a lot of people get tripped up. They say, well, yeah, it says right there, all I've got to do is believe. All I've got to do is believe it. That's on me.
You know, in spite of all the evidence that there was to the contrary, my great grandpa, yes, I remember him quite well. I, I'm blessed to have memories of three of my great grandparents. And my great grandpa McGrady never did believe that a man walked on the moon. His thought was they can show you anything they want to on TV. And I can't argue that fact. I do. I, I am still persuaded that we put a man on the moon. But you, but my grandpa McGrady was my great grandpa McGrady was never persuaded of that fact. And if you want to see him get a little irritated, you just try to argue with him about it a little bit. See, he didn't believe it. Didn't change whether it happened or not. But he didn't believe it. And because he didn't believe it, there were a lot of other things that came along afterwards that, that, that were just a little too incredulous for him, to, for him to wrap his mind around. I'll tell you something else about deciding that you're going to believe something. If you decide you're going to believe it, you can decide you're going to unbelieve it. If you decide to believe this today and something comes along that sounds a little better tomorrow, why well, you, can, you can abandon this and believe that. You see, what we believe under our own power and from our own strength isn't really worth a whole lot. You know, there are still people out there in the world that believe the earth is flat. And they apparently really, truly, sincerely believe that. Now, quite frankly, I don't understand how they can, but they do. Thankfully, them believing it doesn't make it so. You see, our power of belief isn't in and of itself worth a whole lot. Be a firm believer that jolly old fellow that rode through the air in the sleep. I believed it so much that I was real disappointed when I finally figured out that that really wasn't what was going on. That season never was quite the same for me. You see, just as much as I once believed it, I now just that surely disbelieve it. Dad's got an expression because people, you know, people will look at scriptures like this and they'll say all the time, you know, you have to believe. And Dad's comment, Dad's answer to them for years now has been, Amen. You certainly have to believe. When God shows you the truth of a thing, you have to believe. Whenever God convinces your heart of a thing, you have to believe. But what has to happen first is that God has to convince and convict your heart. You can't just take it on yourself to believe. If that were the case, how many of you could honestly believe? How many of you would, would, would even think of believing that a virgin would conceive a son? You know, I don't have any trouble believing it in God's Word because I, I'm persuaded that He has revealed that to my heart. But I'm going to tell you something. One of my youngins ever came up to me and told me that. They, no, we ain't, we ain't going down that road. <laughs> They're not going to convince me of that. There are a whole lot of things, you see, in God's Word that were it not for the Spirit of God abiding in us and God granting us faith, we could not believe it. Now, once God grants us faith, as Dad says, then we must believe it. <laughs> I heard an old brother one time talking about faith and believing and, and how powerful believing the thing was. He said, you know, if, if, if belief is just up to you, he said, you, you believe that's a bottle of water, right? Now, believe it's a gold bar. 
You see, you can't actually make yourself believe that's a gold bar. Because you already know beyond a doubt that it's something else. When God shows us his truth and grants us the grace to believe, we are settled and sure in that because that has come to us from God according to the power of God, according to the love of God, according to the grace of God. We do embrace it. We do believe it. And we're not going to be shaken from it. Now, I do want you to know that from time to time in your life, you will be shaken. And the scripture says that, that we are shaken so that and, and that, that that which remains is what can't be shaken. We go through trials. We go through tribulations. We go through troubles. And sometimes we can't see any reason for it. We can't see any purpose in it. We can't understand why we're having to face it. But if nothing else, when we come out the other side of that thing, you know what invariably I've found? I have lost some of those old notions that, that, that weren't really honoring to God. And I have found out that, that there is a surety in my heart of his grace and his mercy and his continued love and guidance in my life that I didn't have before because things were shaken loose so that what remained was that they couldn't be shaken. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting Not come into possession of, but have. Not, not gain somewhere down the road, not gain in some unforeseen future, but that in believing, that in being given the grace and the understanding to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he was lifted up for us in, in fashion as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, in that belief we have present tense, right now, everlasting life. I want you to know something, child of God. If you're going to sing God's praises in heaven and on more glory when, when this world is done, you own that now. Now, I keep seeing it in its fullness. I'm sure I couldn't take it if I could. <clears throat> Been a few times in my life that he's, he's blessed me to be close enough to it that I've I, I, I felt such an overwhelming joy in the things of God. There have been a couple of times in my life that, that, that I have told people, you know, that, that, that if, if, if that power had grown any more and if that spirit had, had become any sweeter, that all they could be, tell people about me was that the last time I saw it, he was standing there. Because I don't believe my mortal frame could have taken any more of that joy and of that wonder and of the feeling of God's closeness. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. Do you understand why that God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world? <laughs> because the world was already condemned. <laughs> you see, that happened with that, that happened in Adam. <laughs> that happened when Adam transgressed God's law and sin entered into the world and death by sin. The world was already condemned. Jesus didn't need to come to condemn the world. Man had taken care of that already. God's first man, Adam, had seen to that. that the world through him might be saved. Now again, he that believeth on him, Jesus talking about himself here, if you will, in a third person. He that believeth on him is not condemned. You see, the fact that we are able to believe on Jesus Christ 
is God's evidence to our souls. You know, people all the time say, well, well, how can I, you know, how do I know I'm saved? And again, there are a lot among the old Baptists who say you can't and you won't until you get there. But I, I, I don't really find that to be in agreement with the Scripture. I don't believe that you can have everlasting life and not know the power of an everlasting life. I don't believe that you can truly believe in Jesus and not understand that God so loved you that he has given you the grace to understand and believe, to treasure and to worship his only begotten son. I don't believe that God moves in the hearts of his people and leaves them to wonder if there is a God. Now, they might not know what to call it. I, will, I truly believe that God's got people in this world that have never heard the gospel preached, that have never heard the name of Jesus, and that may go to their graves having never heard the name of Jesus. But that does not mean that God has not revealed himself to them in a way that they under, that, that but what they understand that there is a power above all other powers. I've seen witness of it too many times. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not. And you see, I, I, whereas I understand that only God can give us the grace and the faith to believe, I do believe that we can refuse to walk in the power of that belief. That we can be willfully ignorant and willfully disobedient of the things of God. He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And so oftentimes we read that word condemned and the first thing we think of is, well, they're going to hell. They don't, they're not gods. They don't have any, they don't have any hope of, 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 of anything. They don't have any, they don't have any expectation of, of anything eternal. But notice what Jesus said now concerning the thing that he's dealing with here. And this is the condemnation. That light is come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. I've used this example before you before, but I'll share it with you again. Uh, I had a great uncle that for the most of his life, if if people wouldn't tell you he was downright evil, they'd tell you he was one of the meanest men they'd ever met. He never had a kind word to say to anybody. He never had a kind deed to do for anybody. He never expressed any joy. Kind of made fun of his wife for going to church and, and, and for believing in, in God. Resisted on every front, it seemed. In his later years, he became a diabetic. Then he had a stroke. Paralyzed his left side. Then gangrene set up in his foot on the right side. They finally ended up having to take his leg off at the knee. And he was there in his hospital bed, there in the house, and that, you know, that was it. That was all, that was all he could do. And because my Aunt Ernie couldn't get out and go to church, we took church to her every now and then. They some of us show up over there on a Sunday afternoon and we'd sing and we'd pray and we'd preach and one afternoon after all that had gone on for a little while my Uncle Nello began to relate how that when he was 12 years old an angel of the Lord appeared unto him 
and told him that he had wrought a work in his life. And Uncle Noah said, you know, I thought, he said, I thought that all of my life. I've denied it in my own mind and to anybody that ever said, would have ever said anything to me about church or God, I have ridiculed it and I have made fun of it. He said, but there was never a time that I didn't know better. He said, but I just, he said, I wasn't, wasn't the kind, didn't think I was the kind of man that, 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 could, that could follow God. I didn't think I was the kind of man that God could love, and I did my very best to prove it. He said, but that doesn't change what God said to me. That doesn't change what he did in my life. And a couple of Sundays after that, my dad and one of the deacons from the church, I remember, I was paralyzed on one side, leg all up to the knee on the other. They took an old straight back chair and tied him in that straight back chair so he wouldn't float away and carried Uncle Nello in that straight back chair out into the creek and, and baptized him. Now, that baptism didn't save him. But i tell you what it was, just as the scripture says, it was the answer of a clear and acquainted conscience before God. Now, Uncle Nello lived a life, if you will, of condemnation. The condemnation being this, that he loved darkness rather than light because he knew, he understood that his deeds were evil. You see, I, I'm persuaded that, that men that don't know anything about God and godliness, they don't see their deeds as being evil. They don't think about things in terms of good and evil. <clears throat> they just live. He knew his deeds were evil. And he hid from that light most of his life. Kind of like the thief on the cross. But Jesus said, he that doeth truth. Do you, do you get what's taking place here? He didn't say he that believeth truth. Now, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And, you, and he that doeth truth cometh to the light. You see, it's one thing to believe. It's another thing to walk in the light of that belief. It's another thing for that belief to guide our steps, to guide our thoughts, to guide our purpose. It's another thing for us to confess that belief in our lives and not, you see, that, that, that's another part of it. If you, if you let somebody know that you believe in God, they're going to start watching you to see if you mean what you say. Some of them because they're hoping you do. And others of them because they hope that they say, well, you know better than me. You see, that's what, one of the things they don't understand. You're right, I'm not any better than you. I'm not any better than the worst man you can go out here on, and, and find on the street corner anywhere you want to look. I'm not any better. Except that God has been gracious unto me. Except that God has shown me mercy. He that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God's name. This is why when we do truth, we come to the light, and we come to the light not so folks can talk about how good a life we live or how well we walk or, or what wonderful people we are or can come running up and patting us on the back, but so that they are, that, they, that it's made manifest so that they can see that what we do is wrought not in us but in God. testimony unto God of God's great grace and mercy. And child, I'll tell you again, 
if the end result of our walk, of our faith, of our talk, of our worship is not to show that we believe and understand that it comes from God and that it belongs to God and that the glory on it goes back to God, if it doesn't begin and end with God, then we need to take another look at our walk. We need to take another look at what we're, what we're giving ourselves over to. We need to examine ourselves again. Because I'm going to tell you this. If at any point, anywhere, at any time, what we're doing, we're doing because either A, we think it's going to make God owe us something, or B, we think it's going to make God approve of us, or C, we want other people to, 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 to believe that God approves of us. You see, the problem is that all of that comes back to, the focus comes back to what? Us. If the focus comes back to us, then we got a problem. The focus should always, always, always be on him. Because what we have, we have received from him. And the glory we have to give, we have to give to him. And the praise that we offer up belongs to him. And, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm human enough that, you know, I, I, could, I could look at some things over the course of my life and, and break my arm, patting myself on the back. But I know better. Because I know it wasn't me. That if in me there is any good thing at all, that that good thing is God. That that good thing is Jesus Christ. That that good thing is the spirit of truth dwelling in me, showing me the things that belong to Jesus and giving me the grace to give him praise. For God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son. May we give honor and glory and praise to him for that great and unspeakable gift. God bless you.